<laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome aboard. We're about to do a an interview. I'm not. I haven't done many one on one interviews recently, or or one on three in this case, um, because I've been concentrating on, on the mess we're in and I haven't really had time for anything else. I'll be talking today to thoughtful therapy or thoughtful therapists. I'm not, I can't remember which one they said, but we'll find out in a second. Um, uh, so let's just quickly dive into it. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me uh, tonight. Hello. Uh, we have three therapists with us, uh, James Caspian, James S's, and last but certainly not least, my friend Stella O'Malley, who you, uh, a lot of you will know as the host of the wonderful documentary Trans Kids, which um, brought up some of the things we're going to be talking about uh, when no one was really talking about it. And it's how I got to know Stella. Uh, James S's, can I just ask you, first of all, is it thoughtful therapy or thoughtful therapists? Excuse me. Thoughtful therapists. Start right. Okay. So, what is it, James? What is it about? Why did you form? So, it, it's basically an amalgamation of quite a few different, I suppose, splinter groups that emerged over recent years as members of, of our profession become more and more discontented with the lay of the land in terms of treatment for gender dysphoria and the general public discourse on the best way to treat that and obviously recent calls from a number of activist groups for banning, it seems, all forms of therapy that do not affirm transitioning. Um, I myself came across the group because I was feeling quite isolated amongst many in my profession, the training bodies, the regulatory bodies, um, and we, we all happened to kind of come together via social media as a bunch of like-minded therapists who want to do what's in the best interest of clients with gender dysphoria, but just feeling pretty darn unhappy with the lay of the land as things stand. Right. And, and I'm, I'm right in saying that part of the problem is the uh, what, it, what is called the Memorandum of Understanding, which... Um, uh, which which I was wondering if, if perhaps James could explain to us, because I know, James, that you had uh, some involvement in developing the Memorandum of Understanding. Can you explain a little bit about what happened there? Absolutely. Well, the Memorandum of Understanding Against Conversion Therapy, to give it its full title, um, originally was created. It's a policy, basically. It is a policy um, which se seeks to prevent therapists from carrying out conversion therapy initially with gay people so in uh, around about 2014 the memorandum about gay conversion therapy came out and it was being hosted by uh, the psychotherapy regulator UKCP and in 2015 I joined the board of UKCP and uh, I was asked to advise on the extension of the memorandum to include trans people and mm -hmm. so I did and I explained to them that trans wasn't the same as gay because it involved serious medical treatments in many cases and that the memorandum that was being proposed was dangerous because it uh, it could be interpreted to to mean that therapists had to affirm gender identity without any question or exploration and I should uh, emphasize that any properly trained therapist ethically would never um, lead a client in any way. They would accept whatever the client was bringing. If a client came and said, I have a particular gender identity, the, the therapist wouldn't argue with that. They would accept what the person was saying. But the memorandum uh, was worded in such a way to suggest that you could only adopt an exploratory questioning approach with somebody if they were uncertain about their gender identity. So if somebody was certain, the implication being that you could not. And the thing is that by 2018, the memorandum was publicly and in therapy journals being um, cited as saying that you had to affirm. It was actually published in the British uh, Association of Counseling and Psychotherapy Journal, BACP. The journal's called Therapy Today, which goes out to tens of thousands of counselors and they published a letter saying the memorandum makes it clear that affirmation in cases of gender identity is non-negotiable. I'm quoting that. Wow. So, so that's a, a very powerful message to send out. So whatever anybody says about what the memorandum was meant in the first place, the fact is it is being used to say you must affirm gender identity. And that's coming from a particular kind of ideological and stance and set of beliefs about gender identity which are 
um, not everybody agrees with and which you might agree with some of them but not others and so it's very dangerous because ultimately it could lead to and in fact it has led to um, patients being given medical treatment that they come to regret and mm -hmm. uh, patients saying an ex-patient saying that um, I wish that you had explored with me more um, my my problems and what was going on with me because this wasn't the right thing for me to do and and I I said a while ago there were going to be thousands of those people and actually today I looked at the Reddit sub thread on detransition where um, only detransitioners can join and there are now about 19,000 members of that thread 19,000 Wow. And a month ago, it was 18,000. And a month before that, it was 17,000. So that is growing at 1,000 members a month. That's so, so this is not about being against um, trans people or in any way, um, you know, ob objecting to people transitioning. This is about safe and ethical therapeutic practice and medical practice. <laughs> Stella, did you, um, what, what would you say is the uh, nature of the problem with the Memorandum of Understanding as it currently exists? What does it do that it shouldn't um, be doing? I tell, you, I tell you what the problem is. Um, when you transition, you're, you're embarking on a road that has, carries a very heavy medical burden. And it will lead to some dark nights of the soul not even if you're the happiest trans person in the world because it's such a heavy medical burden you're going to be faced with an awful lot of medical issues that you wouldn't have faced had you not transitioned so because of that it needs to be thoroughly explored before you embark upon it because you, you will be stronger within yourself if you do and debbie hayton a lot of people will know she's a trans woman she um i spoke with her years ago and she didn't she is very thankful that she didn't have uh, affirming therapy and she had exploratory therapy when she transitioned and she said her counselor it was very powerful she said her counselor and she went to the counselor for ages before she transitioned and her counselor put a, a actually got up stood up and put a chair in front of the door and said imagine that's the road to transition now let's explore all the other options mm. so that if you do transition you are fully sure you've explored all the other options and Debbie did explore all the other options within the counseling in a very supportive and in a very safe way and in a very kind of um affirming in the in the larger sense of the word as opposed to into the literal sense of the word and um explored it all shows to transition and whenever she has the kind of inevitable as we do with every big decision from marriage to everything to emigration to everything that you make that is massive you have a kind of but what if i had taken that other road mm. she has the very comforting feeling of i explored all the options and i really didn't see another one and so so therefore i took the road for me that's like by 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 kind of not allowing that it's it's not serving the person who wishes to transition. It's it's not helping them. I do want to point out that James Caspian is being very uh, humble there because he, he worked for years with trans people very successfully, and you know what I mean. Like he wasn't just asked to be on the panel he to to, to write the memorandum of understanding. He was understood to be an expert in the field, mm, and mm. so for for James Caspian to be saying there is an issue with this really means people should be listening because James didn't you work for years on this I worked for 10 years um, with people who were transitioning in a medical setting and with a doctor who prescribed and referred and I, I also did assessments for suitability for treatment and before that I had been a trustee of the Beaumont Trust which is a charity that educates about trans people um, I was a trustee of that charity for about 17 years I'd also done research into Trans, transsexual and transgendered people in China and Taiwan and Hong Kong. So I've been around in this field, yes, for many, many years. Also, um, I wasn't the only person concerned about this in the field. All of my colleagues were. We used to discuss it, um, but you don't hear anything from gender clinics. They play their cards close to their chests. They, you know, they keep their business to themselves. Um, you notice that you don't see clinicians from Charing Cross Gender Identity Clinic coming onto things and or, or even on Twitter or anything, I don't think. So, um, but, but yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming at this from a very pragmatic, informed perspective. 
Yes. Yeah. I want to move on to the detail of what actually went wrong while the memorandum was being discussed and why you left, James. But if I could bring in James S's just for a second. Uh, James, when you said that you became, you were feeling kind of frustrated and isolated, how did you start to notice something was wrong? When did, when did it start to trouble you? Well, the first thing that I noticed, I've been a volunteer children's counsellor for about five years now, and, and the first thing that I noticed was the sheer increase in volume of young people coming through to me with gender dysphoria. It was, it was quite striking, and actually the age of the children was becoming younger and younger, and particularly in this technological age we live in, they were finding out this information through activist message boards, etc., and then once they had made up their mind, that was it. They wanted nothing but medication and potentially surgery. So that was what caused me to kind of go down the path of researching this a lot more. I'm currently undertaking a master's in psychotherapy. Uh, and it's, it appears to me, certainly from my cohort, that there's no real room for exploration of the base. It, the, the, the jury's already made its judgment on this one. Um, equally, the regulatory bodies, and I put in a, a personal complaint to my regulatory body, which is the UKCP, um, which regulates many therapists and counsellors in, in the UK. And it went completely unanswered. In fact, the only response I had back was threatening to report me to my institute, um, for having dared raise the topic at all. And all I was doing was saying, listen, you're signed up to this memorandum. I've got concerns about it. Can we engage in a respectful dialogue? And the answer was no. Wow, that's extraordinary. I don't want to segue too much, but wasn't there some story in the Telegraph yesterday that I believe Tish broke about the British uh, medical, some British medical organisation? Stella, you're nodding. What was that? <laughs> yeah, I'm nodding, hoping James S's will explain. The British Psychological <laughs> Society. Yes, British Psychological Society. Was that the group that you wrote to, James? No, that, that's another group. Right, sorry. Uh, but it's but it's it's not dissimilar. Again, the the memorandum has a number of signatories. It's mm -hmm. got it's got about twenty signatories from across the breadth of psychotherapy and counselling. But yes, that that group, the British Psychological Society, is being taken to the Charity Commission, which oversees its work, on the basis that the way it's been acting is lacking really any form of legitimacy or transparency, um, ignoring complaints made by its own members. So it's not dissimilar to the type of complaints that that myself and colleagues put in ourselves. I think it shows, doesn't it, that the kind of uh, mechanism of capture is the same in, in nearly all these institutions. It seems that it's captured quite quietly and silently. And then when people start to speak up, they are isolated and abused and, and threatened, really. It seems to be the same wherever you are. Mm. Mm. I think anyway, that's sorry. right. I, I, I think, yeah. I think uh, bullying goes on because um, when, when I was initially uh advising about the memorandum and i, I was ad advising first the working group that came up with the wording and then secondly the committee that um was running it and the committee had members from um the counseling organizations also from nhs england the royal college of gps the royal college of psychiatrists the royal college of nursing um, i mean we're talking about a pretty illustrious committee um mm. and despite my recommendations being approved by my board and my recommendations were that the memorandum should be made safe by acknowledging that people sometimes regretted gender transition and detransitioned and that it was all right to work with them and that it was all right to explore with people um, especially given that we were seeing so many younger women especially with complex mental health issues coming and asking for treatment um, and, and so I, I was simply recommending to make it safe and this was completely sidelined and I heard from three or four different people that there was a lot of bullying that went on and that people were afraid to speak up. Right and when did you walk away from the process? Well I sat on that board for two years. I left uh, in early 2017 because um, I, I had other reasons for leaving. That, that wasn't uh, especially the reason why I left, but I left right at the height of the memorandum going through that committee and it had in fact been taken to the Minister in Parliament to be discussed by that point. Um, and everything I tried to do about it pretty much had been sidelined. I think only one or two things I said were put in it. For instance, um, it actually stated initially that one could not make a judgment 
when working with these clients. And I pointed out that if you were assessing somebody for medical treatment, how could you not possibly make a clinical judgment? That was crazy. So they actually did include in it that wording that you could make, you know, a clinical judgment or treatment. Um, but it was pretty clear to me that there was an agenda behind the memorandum. And what that agenda was actually was coming from people who were coming from a very different place from those of us who might have worked clinically and medically. Uh, it was coming from people who had more of a political and ideological interest in gender identity and, and not necessarily in medical transition at all. In fact, most of the people um, I've observed who seem to be most active in that element of the memorandum are, are not in any way uh, connected to medical transition. So that wasn't on their minds. I think what was on their minds was um, that they believed that there were these huge cohorts of young people who really were trans, whatever that is, because that's not something that's ever really established, what it, you know, mm. what it is. I mean, I can tell you from working in a clinic that people come and ask for treatment for lots of different reasons. There isn't one kind of intrinsic trans person you know that there are people there are just individuals with different feelings about themselves trying to make sense of themselves um and, and so 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 i think the people who were angling for this memorandum had a, a an ideological and political motivation to try to they're kind of iconoclasts they, they want to have a kind of gender revolution where they completely break down any kind of um binary gender roles. I mean, they talk about gender identity, but I see it more in terms of roles, you know, the gender roles that people have, how men are meant to be and how women are meant to be and, and the kind of collective assumptions and history of all that. It's quite complex indeed. So I think they wanted to make it that, you know, you couldn't argue with someone who said, well, I'm this other gender identity or I'm that or I'm non-binary or I'm um, one of the many, you know, there's 72 different genders on one yeah. uh, thing I looked at. So um, I think that's what they were thinking. Yeah, I think that's what they were, they were thinking. They they wanted to educate these, you know, ignorant therapists that there are all these other ways of being out there and all these different gender identities, and you're going to have to, te you know, agree with that. But they what they haven't realised that actually this is going to affect people medically and that thousands and thousands of people are transitioning and then saying they regretted and detransitioning. And there is the evidence out there that that is the case. James asks, when you see someone who is experiencing gender dysphoria or what they've potentially self-diagnosed as, as gender dysphoria, what are some of the... Um, what are some of the things you see that are actually underlying this these feelings like i understand autism is sometimes um or, or there's a large percentage of autistic uh, people who consider themselves trans are there any others that um that that you 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 have kind of experienced yeah so that you know i've i've experienced firsthand and the research shows significant amounts of comorbidity you've touched upon autism which is kind of a new and emerging link that we found um, there's a lot of anecdotes about internalized homophobia, um, previous traumatic experiences, bullying. Um, but I think the most fundamental thing, and you know, we're particularly concerned about children, obviously, because of the vulnerable position that they're in. But the most crucial thing that people need to understand is that most children who experience gender dysphoria or some discomfort with their gender will in time come to settle into their biological sex now it's it's completely unsurprising that children might go through this period of time when we consider what teenage years and adolescence is like i mean the significant neuropsychological and social and physical changes that somebody's going through the hormones running through your body for many it can turn the world upside down start causing them to question lots of things about themselves and their place in the world but often it will just settle down and actually therapy again in research has been shown to be very effective in helping people navigate this quite bumpy road and get to a place in which they can become comfortable with who they are yes yeah i i find it extraordinary that there's a whole kind of um movement uh that's sort of sacrificing these children in pursuit of a political end like i, I you know Stella, I don't know what you think, but like I, the, the idea of removing gender roles that are that are usually sexist is is kind of good on the uh, surface. 
but this seems like a, a, a completely destructive approach to them that doesn't really take into account the humanity uh, behind people it just seems to be trying to impose a certain kind of well as we both know it it's it seems to impose gender roles a lot of the time mm -hmm. rather than uh rather than take them away is there anything is there, is there anything to be said for it <laughs> for what's happening at the moment um <laughs> it's intellectually probably interesting i do think that people need to know more than anything that this is based on on a theory so like let's say if you go back to like the 50s and 60s you know john money and robert stoller were working with intersex people people with dsds development sex disorders and they developed a theory that there was a concept called the hermaphrodite identity and that's what they called it because they were a bit stumped when they were working with intersex people now frankly these two were quacks because the the work they did was pretty pretty outrageous like john money was the was the very dubious doctor who oversaw the um, horrible, horrible case of David Reimer. And David Reimer was a, a, a boy who was born a boy. He was, he was a twin. And when he was seven months old, there was the surgery on his penis and it was botched. And his, his parents brought him, brought them into John Money. And John Money, in, in an extraordinary grandiose kind of idea of being a pioneer of his identity theory, he mm. said, this child can be raised as a girl. And so this boy was then raised as a girl and it went very, very badly. For 30 years, he was the poster child of, of a success story. Now he was reporting bouts of depression, but he was being called by John Money and his, and his colleagues, this great success story of, of how social roles are imposed upon us and anybody can be a woman and anybody can be a man, et cetera, et cetera. And then he died by suicide, very sadly. So this was a really, really sad and awful story and John Money's theory was at the center of it. John Money and Robert Stoller. And then, you know, like there was the 60s and 70s and there was a bit of a heyday with, with people transitioning. And then in the 80s, you know, the, 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 the American kind of health bureau took away the kind of the insurance policy around transitioning. And there was a kind of, it slowed down for a long time. And then the identity theory has been resurrected. It's been resurrected along with queer theory, which is a whole other theory that would stand your head on, stand everything on your head. And people have ran with it, which is fine and dandy. It's fine to run with a theory. It's fine to have a theory, but it's not fine to impose your theory on others. And so other people have a theory, which would be called gender critical, which is we're born and the, as you were kind of saying, the identity roles are, are, pushed upon us. It's not that we have a gender identity, the gender identity is, is imposed upon us. And then other people would have another theory, which would be a kind of biopsychosocial theory, which would be, well, we have our biology and some of our hormones and our biology perhaps makes us work in certain ways, but society does as well and so does our psychology. So there's a lot of theories out there, but right now in this moment in time, we're being told there's one truth there's one truth only, and that's gender identity, which is invisible and unfalsifiable. You can't find it, but you can't, you can, it's unfalsifiable. It's, it's, it's so like the religion that I grew up in, that I presume you grew up in, Father Ted, yourself, that this, <laughs> you know, it's so like the Catholic, where there is, there is one God, but there's three gods, and there's a holy trinity, and there's one yes. of the three. Ah. That's very interesting. Yes, it, it it is very hard. Like like I've never heard the same uh, explanation of gender twice. I've never heard the same explanation of trans. Like no one. If you do, uh, I I noticed that when I was arguing on Twitter, when I was wasting my time arguing on Twitter, I I at the time when I would mo usually be blocked was when I asked a question like, what does trans mean? What is a trans woman? And so on, you know? And the, these days I would be very annoying because I just keep asking, is Eddie Izzard trans? Because I, I find that one of the most egregious, uh, uh, say the man who, who who gained a great deal of, of respect for being a kind of eccentric and-, and, and Popular. Uh, yeah, and a, and a person it's who fabulous. everyone admired. Yeah. And now he's labeled himself as this political movement which is um, which is set up in opposition to so many things that I uh, I, I care about, like women's rights and 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 the safety of children. You know, like I saw one very interesting thing with that mermaids did. Um, I'll I'll see if I can track down the photograph and splice it in. But but they had a, a list of all the things that might make you trans, 
And it mm -hmm. was just a, a description of the average teenager. You know, it was it was one of the most reckless things I think I've ever seen. Mm. Uh, sorry, anyone drop in on that? I, I, I just leave that. <laughs> I just put that open for discussion. I mean, yeah. do, do you see do you see kind of uh, uh, mermaids and, and, and the Tavistock have, mermaids especially have been accused of um, of uh, what, what would you call it? Uh, rehearsing kids, making sure they give the right questions to get the right drugs and so on. Um, have you seen evidence of this uh, uh, yourselves? Um, I, I personally have come across it all the time. This, this is the problem. It's already been touched upon. It's become extremely politicized. I mean, we, we live in a, a culture in which identity politics is king. So what better way than when people can create their own identity, self-identify as whatever that they choose, and then use that as they will. But as we've touched upon, these aren't just political games. These are having impacts on you know many, many vulnerable people in society. I mean, in my place of work where I carry out my counselling, they had posters, uh, this is about a year ago, they had posters plastered all over the wall from Stonewall, um, who are a particularly militant bunch. And, and the poster said, some people are trans, get over it. And I yeah. thought, what a way to shut down discussion and dialogue. And, and I wasn't prepared to get over it. Yeah. Um, but this, this is the problem. And, and we live in a society in which uh, a, a disfavoured opinion is worse than having bad taste in many mm. ways, actually. Mm. Um, you know, this obsession with political correctness. You yourself have been the victim of this in terms of speaking out for what you believe in. I mean, it's what we're trying to do as a cohort, but as we've already said, it's not necessarily safe ground for us. You know, we have threats lobbed at us left, right and centre, including from those who regulate and should be protecting our ability to have free speech and professional dialogue about these issues. Yeah. Well, that, well actually, that uh, reminds me of something that happened a few years ago when I was very worried about the memorandum um, this was in the early days, about five or six years ago, when nobody else really knew anything about it. And so I went to the Portman and Tavistock, that's the children's gender identity clinic, and I met with somebody very senior there. And I spent a couple of hours and, and I, I explained that, you know, I'd been beginning to research detransitioners and that I was worried about the memorandum and the whole subject. And the person I spoke to said, oh, I thought we weren't supposed to talk about that. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's... what can I say? I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. You know, um, somebody senior in a clinic of that power yes. knows. Yes. They knew already in 2015 that they weren't supposed to be talking about it. And who mm. worked in talk therapy. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's thought. extraordinary. It's a, it, it also that that the kind of um, uh, uh, the kind of uh, what would you call it fire guard or something about around this conversation the the protective yeah. barrier that means that no one can talk about it it makes it more understandable I guess that uh, that th this kind of it's kind of a self negating idea the idea that that gay conversion therapy must be banned and also. Uh, tr uh, gender conversion therapy, because as as we know, affirmation is gay con often is often g gay conversion therapy. It is often, as someone described it, putting a putting a gay person back into a closet made of their own body, which I thought is, is one of my favorite descriptions of it. Um, uh, obviously, that's not true for everyone. Some people have, do have a successful uh, experience with it. But we know that there's a lot of gay people who are being pushed down this road. Butch lesbians especially get a terrible time. We know, um, Laura, is it Lauren of LGB yeah. Alliance in Ireland? Lauren, yeah. You know, they, people literally tell her to transition. Her very ex existence, because she's a butch lesbian with gender dysphoria, her very existence threatens these people. And they'll tell her to transition. It's an extraordinary situation. Yes, you're, you're right. I, I've met patients who... Um, asked for treatment because their friends and flatmates told them that they ought to go and get hormones. People who were yeah. cross-dressing, because in the old days, you know, you had cross-dressers, you had transsexuals, you had other kinds of people. Um, they weren't necessarily the same thing, but now everybody's kind of lumped in. 
So yes, this idea that, oh, well, you must be trans, you should transition. Um, and, and I think it's important, Graeme, to emphasize that uh, certainly for me, everything I say about um, what's happening out there and what's going on with people is not my opinion. It's either what I've observed objectively or it's what people have actually told me. So a lot of the things I've said about detransitioners are what detransitioners themselves have actually told me. I'm coming from any kind of political or ideological agenda. I worked for years helping people to transition because yes. I thought it was the right thing to do. But then it started to become very wobbly and rocky and some people started to come back and sue the doctor and complain and say you shouldn't have let me and and so on and so forth but but i i've read hundreds of accounts from detransitioners and met some of them and spoken to them and they are the ones that say they were influenced by the internet they are the ones that say there was peer group pressure they are the ones that say that uh that they 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 wished that they had been asked to explore more all of their more in-depth problems and histories mm. i'm not saying that they're saying it mm. Stella, what were you going to say there? Yeah, good for you, James. Um, I, I what you just said reminds me of Kira Bell, like, and she, she, you know, had the the brought the judicial review against the Tavistock, and she said, "I was vulnerable. I was distressed. I was a very unhappy kid. And you should have explored my ideas more. You should have challenged me more. Affirmative therapy didn't work for me, and it ended up that she transitioned. She was on puberty blockers at 16, she was on cross sex hormones at 17. A couple of years later, she had a, you know, a double mastectomy. And now she's 23 years old and regrets it all and doesn't know whether she's infertile and stuff. She didn't get the privilege of good therapy. What she mm. got instead was, was affirmative therapy and it didn't, it didn't work out at all well for her. And I know I work, I work for the IATDD and that's International Association for Desisters and Detransitioners of therapists for a I know it's a mouthful. And they, uh, I, I've noticed, I work a lot with detransitioners these days, and every one of them are absolutely furious with the therapist that they had prior to transitioning. They were very, very unhappy with it. And mm. I think just something you lifted earlier, now that I've, <laughs> now I've got the stage, I want to point out that this whole, this whole mess, the, if you ask me, the mess we're in is very much underlined with People think trans is the new gay. Mm. And they think, oh yeah, just nod along. We were we were resistant to gay people in the 80s and 90s. Now it's trans, it's gay part two. We should nod along to this. We don't get it because we're not trans, but that's what it is. And an awful lot of gay people, very well-meaning gay people who haven't frankly given transitioning very much thought, are just nodding along in a very quick decision, thinking positivity is nodding, as yes. opposed to sometimes you have to be a little bit more um a little bit more careful and a little bit more understanding and compassionate about when you're messed up as an adolescent you can be very certain of what your what your solution is and it's up to the adults in the room to be the adults in the room mm -hmm. yes that's that's one thing i keep talking about the fact that they're in so many organizations including organizations where uh the stakes could not be higher uh than what they're working on you know children's health and happiness adults have, have left the room and to such an extent now that as i say that these this these two things can exist together gay conversion therapy and trans conversion therapy as if they didn't cancel each other out do you know what i mean by they, that it's yeah. yeah they crash they they fundamentally yeah. don't it should be two separate documents i think now james s's and james caspian will probably know more but my, my own vibe about this is if there was two documents, if there was a gender identity conversion therapy document and a sexual orientation one, then we'd have clarity and we'd know what we're talking about and we would know what's appropriate and what's not. These are not the same. They don't have the same arc of development. They don't have any, there's almost, there's very little. There is some sort of vague, yeah, there's similarities in a couple of fields, but there is a, that with everything. I just want to say about the, the, the children transition, Dr. Stephen Levine, who first started working with transition transitioning, he's a psychiatrist, and he was in WPATH, and he was in, before WPATH was the Harry Benjamin Gender Dysphoria Association, and he was mm. in that. And this guy was the chair of the standing standards of care, and he said there's no other field of medicine where such radical interventions are offered to children with such a poor evidence base. This is not supported with an evidence base. 
So yeah. this this idea of, of transitioning children with puberty blockers, there is no evidence base to support this. Mm. People don't seem to realize that because they think trans is the new gay and I haven't thought about it enough. And I think yeah. people really need to engage now. But I'm interested, do James and James think that there should be separate identity, separate documents? Or what, what is the solution with the MOU, I wonder? Well, well, it, it's difficult, <laughs> isn't it? Because um, if it, one thing, it would be good if the MOU um, actually abided by the nice guidelines, which it never did, which is that it should have an evidence base. It should be reviewed annually using a peer-reviewed evidence base. To my knowledge, uh, that's never happened. I was told in the original committee that any uh, requests for an evidence base were resisted by the people who were really pushing for the MOU. So, um, you know, it hasn't followed due process. So it'd be nice if it just followed due process to begin with, and these conversations could be had. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, you should begin with looking at what is convert, what is trans conversion therapy? What is that? Where is it? Has it been happening? Um, it seems as though a lot of the discussion was based on the kind of gay conversion therapy that went on in the United States that was quite um, scary. Uh, I, I'm not aware that if it's gone on here that it's borne any um, semblance to that whatsoever. Um, you know, things like trying to cast demons out of people and, and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, I, I don't think that's happened here. If it has, I'd like to see the evidence for it. I'd just like to see an evidence base and a discussion mm -hmm. and an adult discussion where you can ask questions and say things that don't fit particular theories without being intimidated effectively, which is what has been happening on a big scale. I mean, I told you about the senior person at the Portman Tavistock uh, with whom I met who said, um, oh, I thought we weren't supposed to be talking about this. Well, a, a, a very senior person in the psychotherapy regulator told me that, oh, I'm a secret supporter of yours. This was referencing to my attempt to research detransition, which was prevented by Bath Spy University um, and, and against which I fought a four year legal battle to try and get a court hearing, which in the end I didn't on technicalities. Um, but the, the university told me I couldn't do my research and wrote down on their ethics form that um, it could cause criticism of the university and it was better not to upset people and things like that. Um, so this whole uh, uh, kind of culture of, oh, you mustn't upset people, you can't say anything, you mustn't upset people, that, that so, somebody's got to stand up to this. You know, people have to have the guts to stand up to it. No one had the guts in that psychotherapy regulator, no one. Not one person. Well, actually, no, one or two people did, but they were completely sidelined and ignored. Well, I was one of them. Um, and it's very easy to sideline and ignore people. You know, you, you just kind of manipulate them and you kind of don't tell them about things or you miss them out of meetings and stuff like that. I, I mean, you know, I suppose these kind of things go on in all sorts of organisations. It's about power. In the end, it's all about who's got the power, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, it, it's, an, it's a really unacceptable situation that, um, you know, very powerful public bodies uh, can, can actually make policy without following due process. And there's got to be something that people can do about that, and they should. Yeah, it's often true, isn't it, that the things that we want, uh, as I know you hate this term, Stella, but as, as gender, having vaguely gender critical beliefs, is that people just follow the law or people just follow best practice the way it exists. The things that, that w w we are always being attacked for taking an extremely responsible position. You know, it's an extraordinary situation. James S. I just wanna, uh, just wanna talk briefly about something that's um, to move around uh, um, to, uh, before we move on to what happens next and what thoughtful therapists are going to be uh, doing to, to, to try and sort out some of this stuff. But one of the problems it seems to me in talking about this is that there are a number, one of the first times that I realized I was getting into trouble was when I, when I started taking exception to people using the word turf, right? That was immediately leaped on and, and seen as proof that I was a turf and all this sort of stuff, you know, but the, merely disliking the word because of the way it's used, which is as a violent misogynistic slur, got me into trouble. 
And there's other words, it seems to me, that are similarly protected by trans rights activists, like cis is a very protected word. They, they, they you know, do not like you objecting to cis. But also, the, the, I think the most dangerous one that I see around that I really think has to get nipped in the bud is the term trans kids, because it, it immediately places a huge section of kids outside normal safeguarding procedures. Like, what do you think about the about the the, the la is there a way of fighting back against the language that's being used to obfuscate the issue and, and confuse people? I, I think you're completely right, Graham. I mean, language is absolutely everything, but I think for a lot of activists and ideologues, that's the very easy win for them, actually. And once you get people thinking and speaking the same language as you, it's much easier to take them even further down the path that you want them. I mean, we even see it in the use of pronouns. The fact now that, and I've seen it myself, I've seen large corporate organizations encouraging to their entire set of staff to put what their pronouns are on their email signature. Yeah. And people, of course, go along with it because they don't want to upset the apple cart. They want to be seen to be allies and good people. But all of a sudden you get people who never have previously even questioned their gender, already start thinking, am I? You know, what am I? Same with children. I mean, one of, the, one of the first things that young children learn is the difference between boys and girls. It actually helps them to make sense of the world around them. What we're doing is actually very cruel. We're saying to those young people, actually, everything that you thought you knew, it's not the okay. case. And actually, you simply assigned something by someone at birth, and it doesn't mean that's who you are. I mean, yeah. how, how chaotic must that be for a young person in their mind. So I think language is, is absolutely everything. And I think we must fight back against those who either prohibit certain language or even worse, mandate certain language. Mm. And so, so to move on to uh, what happens next, what are, what are your plans as a group, uh, Stella? Can you give us a, an overview of what you're gonna try and do, be doing with the group? I think what we'd like more than anything is to amend the, the memorandum of understanding to be a better document, to be a more accurate and a more careful document that uses language appropriately and accurately and doesn't conflate gender identity with sexual orientation. Certainly that's what I would like. Um, I know James Esses has, has uh, doing very well with the petition um, that he has running. How many th signatures is there now? Uh, we're just under 6,000 and it's not yeah. even two weeks, but that's, I think, going to be the next battleground because the memorandum is one thing, but the fact that the government are supposedly going to be um, criminalising conversion therapy, um, and we've seen that to very ill effect in countries such as Canada and Australia, um, and I think that will scare a lot of therapists, that if they are seen in any way to be challenging someone's gender identity, that they could end up being disbarred or even serving a prison sentence so you know i would ask all of those listening and watching to please sign and share this petition because we need to get to ten thousand to make sure that the government respond to us and actually take our concerns into account i'll place a link in the uh description yeah. and I'll, I'll post a post it on my blog as well stella uh, um, there's a couple of things there that was raised like I think this petition is very important and i do think it needs to be raised but like as james caspian was saying earlier I'm not convinced. I know the awful and sad and horrible history of conversion therapy. And Alan Turing, you know, who pretty much was the code breaker who won the war, you know, was subject to um, uh, conversion therapy. He was a gay man. And, you know, what I find really fascinating about this is the conversion therapy that Alan Turing, Alan Turing was subject to was uh, being given estrogen. So it was exactly what we're worried about of gay people being given hormones. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was exactly, and he ended up dying by suicide. Yet another person lost um, to this to this kind of awful, awful kind of situation. But conversion therapy. therapy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that is real conversion therapy. Yeah, but that's the 19, whenever it was. It was the 50s, I think. It was a long, long time ago. How much conversion therapy is happening now beyond extreme religious zealotry, maybe yes. in far out weird places? I have, I've worked as a therapist for years, for years, and I've come across so many people who are so angry with their therapists, many, many in recent years with their affirmative therapists, but I've still yet to come across somebody who, who 
experienced gay conversion therapy, not because it didn't happen a lot way back in the day, but I'm not convinced it's happening all that often now. And I can't help but think this is a very strong push around gender, trying to get gender to be conflated as trans is the new gay and let's all, let's all roll with it. But that point about the trans kid that you, you uh, raised, it's such an important point because I was a kid who had really, um, who was very confused with my gender, very disturbed with my gender, had all the kind of, if I went through the gender dysphoria um, tick list on the DSM to be diagnosed, I was able to easily tick yes, 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 for all the criteria. And you only as a child need to have those criteria for six months. I had that criteria for over seven years and it's mm. still, it, I moved beyond it. Mm. And so it, people need to be very careful of presuming that they've a trans kid when they've got something that I would argue, and the stats bear me out, 80% of kids are like me. They move mm. beyond. From every peer reviewed study that's ever been carried out on children with gender dysphoria, 80% of them move into where I am, which is more comfortable in their own skin eventually. And a lot of them, about 67% of them, end up being gay or lesbian or bi. So, you, you know, we've got to be very careful with our language and make sure that we're not foreclosing identity, foreclosing kind of fertility, foreclosing sexual functioning. Because if you take puberty blockers and if you go on to cross sex hormones, that means you'll be unfertile. And also it means your sexual functioning, your ability to have a natural orgasm is ruined like this is massive and it's really really awful to think children and i've met them have made those decisions and have ruined their future sex lives before they've ever had sex and they've mm. had mastectomies before anybody's ever you know before, before they've ever had any pleasure with their breasts like like it's really awful and we need to be graphic so that people will understand the actual reality of talking about these kids rather than thinking happy clappy wear pink yeah it's it's an interesting um uh it's an interesting argument from their side because there's never a stable you you can't argue with the, the other side on stable ground because it always changes like for instance i know one thing that would be said was um you know well kids naturally desist and you would make this point and they'd say well you're saying that as if there's something wrong with being trans <laughs> you well, know, I don't think there's nothing wrong with it, but it carries a very heavy, heavy medical burden. And so, if yeah. you can avoid it, you should probably avoid it. Juno Dawson, the activist, says in her own book, "If you can avoid transitioning, you should avoid it because it's that difficult on you. It's very hard in the body. You're kind of subject to kind of hospital appointments and injections for the rest of your life, and complications mm. with your heart. With your, I'm sure James Caspin, you'll know more about this, but you're suffering a lot when you." Mm medically transition yes I, I, th I think that's right I'm, I'm talking talking to people who'd transitioned decades ago uh, most of them would bear that out but uh, they, they might say uh, well it, yes it was the right thing to do at least at the time um, it's worked out for me in many ways but um, they've paid a price for it very often because of side effects of treatment uh, and, and the effect on health um, because obviously, the, you know, the endocrine system is extremely delicate, and then the surgeries. If people have surgeries, that that, that it, it is a really tough road to take. Um, and 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 most of those people uh, would pretty much agree with what we're saying and say that the caution would be advised and that serious consideration should be advised. Absolutely. Mm. One thing I've noticed is that people have transitioned for a long time. I'm not saying that they're older. People who've transitioned for a long time tend to be much more reasonable and much more engaged in in what should what's appropriate. And people who are on that, you know, couple of years high, even if they're middle aged, they're just oh, I should have done it years ago. And I just don't think that's a reasonable way to kind of understand something because it takes some years to understand a massive decision. It just does. That's right. And the other thing that's a mistake is for people to, to take their own experience and then extrapolate it onto everybody else. Yes. So a lot of people who have been drivers in, in some of the developments in, in trans have their own personal agendas, either uh, because it's to do with them personally or because they're the relatives or parents or partners 
of, of people who've transitioned um, because they've seen those people suffer and they don't, uh, you know, and, and so, they, so they take their own experience and they're very driven by that. Um, but they, they really ought to stop and think that actually not everybody is either like them and not everybody is necessarily like their partner or their relative or their child. Um, you know, people are, are very, very different. As I said earlier, people come to gender clinics and ask for treatment for lots of different reasons. Hmm. So it's complex and nuanced, and that should be discussed. Absolutely. Complexity and nuance in psychology. I can't see it catching on. Um, but, uh, but, but um, yeah, well, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of so far out of my depth that it's going to be hard for me to think of a <laughs> to find a way to elegantly escape this conversation <laughs> but it has been it has been brilliant and really interesting and and i'm, I'm... Now, now we're going to psychoanalyze you ah oh, thank you yes i was worried about that that was our first sitcom actually our first sitcom was about a psychoanalyst who moves to a small town and the uh the, the main joke yeah the main joke was every time he passed by a group of people they just immediately stopped talking that was the only <laughs> joke we the only joke really we we had that i can remember um but but listen uh best of luck with um the petition and best of luck with the group if I can help in any way, please let me know. Um, we can do this again as well if, if something comes up. I have a feeling the next few days are going to be pretty seismic. Um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, of course, if they're not, I'll just delete this bit. Um, but, uh, but thank you so much for joining me, and, um, and, and best of luck in your attempts to do something about this situation. Thank you very much. Okay.